Good evening, everyone, and a warm welcome to tonight's research forum event here at the Courtauld, featuring our distinguished speaker, Jagat Thwarasinghe. So my name is Lori Wong, and I'm a senior lecturer here at the Courtauld, uh, and together with my colleague, Sujata Migama, who will shortly introduce tonight's speaker, we co-convene an interdisciplinary MA course, which is focused on art history and conservation of Buddhist heritage. So both this lecture series, um, and you see here uh, some of the talks that are coming up, so I hope you will take note. Um, this lecture series, as well as this MA course, are generously supported by the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation, which has endowed the Center for Art History and Conservation of Buddhist Heritage here at the Courtauld. So tonight's lecture is the first of four talks, as you can see, that discuss current topics impacting Sri Lanka's heritage. And we are just honored to bring together leading voices in the fields of archaeology, conservation, education, and religious studies. So these talks will address such issues as colonial legacies, religious nationalism, ethnic and religious conflict, and present examples of decolonizing collections, digitization projects, celebrating multi-faith heritage sites, and nature culture links that really try to look toward Sri Lanka's future. And this series that we are presenting, these four talks that you see here on the screen, are part of the Arts of the Buddhist World Heritage and Conservation Series. This is a series that began last year in the relaunch, in the, in the lead up to the relaunch of this MA course in Art History and Buddhist Heritage that I mentioned. And what we were trying to do here is to expand and challenge the ways in which religious heritage that embodies religious and sacred values is researched, cared for, curated, engaged with, and valued. So I thank you all for coming today and I'm gonna hand over to Sujata to introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Good evening to all of you, and a warm welcome to all of you to the Courtauld and our um, first lecture series as we relaunched the MA in Buddhist Art History and Conservation. It's my privilege um, today to introduce um, Jagat Virasinghe. Um, Jagat um, Virasinghe is first and foremost a contemporary artist. Uh, a giant of the 90s art trend, I first encountered um, him um, through a Japanese documentary over 20 years ago when I was uh, living and working in the Bay Area. And in it I learned that Jagat's efforts um, um, to create a memorial to the disappeared of those who were massacred in the 1980s, in the late 1980s in um, Sri Lanka. A few years later, on a visit to Sri Lanka, um, I had the privilege of meeting Jagat in person. Um, and I discovered that he wears many hats. Um, he's a conservator, an archaeologist, an art historian, an educator, an administrator, a collaborator, and of course, a dear friend. Jagat's uh, a for the former director of the Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology at the University of Kalania. Um, Jagat's work spans many disciplines, um, heritage studies, modern and contemporary art history, and much more. He has held fellowships at the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property in Rome, and at the Getty Conservation Institute in LA. Whether he's making contemporary art or conserving paintings or um, working with communities on heritage management issues, Jagat Singer asked us to critically engage with the anxieties of a contemporary historical movement. Please join me in welcoming Jagat Singer to the podium. Thank you, Sujata. Thank you, Lori, for inviting me. Um, it's a great honor and privilege to do this at this esteemed institution. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. I, <coughs> I hope I will make some sense of a very critical, um, very critical problem or a condition that we live through, we have been living through for many decades in Sri Lanka, 
in the way I see it. Um, <clears throat> as you see, my title is concerning Buddhist stupas, religious nationalism and archaeology in Sri Lanka, because these, these, these things work together to create a particular kind of environment for us to live with. Um, <clears throat> the complex relationship um, that archaeology and heritage have with nationalism is a well-documented phenomenon in the history of archaeology. The ways uh, in which archaeology has been put to political use in nation-building programs have been the subject of a number of scholarly publications. You know, one is Bruce Trigger has very well documented it, and, and so many others. Nationalist archaeologies <coughs> are a dominant form in countries like Sri Lanka and India, which were erstwhile colonies. These nationalist archaeologists have, by default, by default, tried to forge strong links between ancient peoples and places and the nation state and its modern inhabitants. This is what nationalist archaeology tries to do wherever and whenever it can, wherever it works, to convert archaeological data into ethnic data. Gustav Kosinna's uh, nationalist archaeology which helped to fortify German nationalism and pave the way for Nazi ideology in the second quarter of the 20th century is perhaps the most poignant example of this in, in the modern era. How archaeology served violence. His writings, I mean Kosinna's writings, argued that similarities and differences in the archaeological record correspond to ethnic similarities and differences. I'm sure it sounds familiar to those who are to so, no archaeology in Sri Lanka and in India. This is central to any nationalist or racist archaeology. Such nationalist and racist statements are bound in Sri Lankan archaeology. And the Sri Lankan media is enamored with such bad archaeology. Archaeology's relationship with nationalism in Sri Lanka has been the scholarly has been in the been the scholarly focus in Elizabeth Nissan's uh, wonderful, interesting study, History in the Making. Essay and Pradeep Jagannathan's Authorizing History, Ordering Land Essay, where both of them examine the idea of Anuradhapura, is one of the ancient capitals of Sri Lanka, or the first capital of Sri Lanka. The idea of Anuradhapura, the ancient capital of Sri Lanka, emerging as the sinosha of the nation as a result of nationalizing process. Nisan and Jagannathan have shown the workings of singular Buddhist nationalism and colonial historiography together in the making of a particular kind of history for Anuradhapura. Nisan traces this process quite succinctly. I quote, I quote uh, Nisan, Anuradhapura came to be shaped by a new nationalist consciousness, that of Singhala Buddhist nation as a historically constant, as a, that of, as a historically constant, homogeneous bounded entity. Close the quote. The purpose of this kind of history, as mentioned above or earlier, is to assert tie up with the past within an imagined history of a preferred ethnic group, the very stuff of very stuff of extreme nationalism. Archaeology in Sri Lanka began in Anuradhapura, so to speak. Sri Lankan archaeology as a field practice has been mostly concerned with surveying, excavating, and conserving stupas and other religious buildings. Conserving and restoring Buddhist stupas has always taken the center stage in Sri Lankan archaeology. Archaeological excavation and systematic ex examinations of stupas and monastic buildings in Anuradhapura, which is now a World Heritage Site, began in around 1884, towards the end of the 19th century. Even today, conservation or restoration of stupas command the attention of the highest political authority in the country. This presentation takes Two such examples as its main focus of engagement, the conservation of the Abhagiri Stupa in Anuradhapura and the Sandhagiri Stupa in Sitsamaharama in the south of Sri Lanka. Image on the top is, is, is from Anuradhapura and that is uh, this uh, Sandhagiri Stupa in Sitsamaharama. My intention in this presentation is to critically discuss the crisis laden path that the conservation of the Abhagiri Stupa in Anuradhapura took and the issue surrounding the launching ceremony of the conserved Stupa. 
and question the meaning of the restored Sandhagiri Stupa in the Samara. I intend to demonstrate the nature of a deep crisis that undermines and prevents Sri Lankan archaeology from becoming a critical discipline with reflexivity. The study of the past of the island became a fully institutionalized vocation with the, with the establishment of the Archaeological Survey Department in 1890, following decades of antiquated activities that began in around 1860s. The year 1890, the birth year of the department, is considered as the birth date of scientific archaeology in Sri Lanka. This is how archaeologists uh, describe that, uh, that birth of the department. It is very interesting, they use the word birth of scientific archaeology. This one may argue, or I would argue, that the 19th century that that the 19th century marks the origin of the institutionalization of positivist historiography in Sri Lanka, the epistemological tradition that is my mean, positivist approach to archaeology. <coughs> the, and I, this is an epistemological tradition that is highly contested today, but still continue to date in most Sri Lankan archaeologists, the way they think about archaeology, antiquarian sentiments still motivate many Sri Lankan archaeologists. Many seem to believe, this is very interesting, if, you, if enough data is found, then the truth about the past can be established. If you find enough archaeological data, then you can establish a single truth about the past. Many seem to think that archaeological data precedes the discourse of archaeology. They think archaeological data is self-preferential. They don't feel, seem to realize that archaeological data are the results of interpretation, the results of a discourse. What this means for, for me is that the way we imagine the past today is still located in the colonial past of Sri Lanka, deeply enmeshed in the colonial rhetoric of the 19th century. Our almost unshakable and popular perception of the past of Sri Lanka, and let me quote Jagannathan again, is the real effect of the authoritative epistemological conquest of the 19th century. Said in other words, in the context of history writing and the popularization of, of, of a particular kind of historical thought, archaeology provided an empirically grounded colonial language of essentialism for the employment of the history of Sri Lanka, a language still at work in the field of archaeology. I'm sure it, it is still at work in the, in the field of, of, of historiography, of history writing. The language, this language detains Sri Lankan archaeology from becoming a critical social practice, and this is my major concern. What is detaining Sri Lankan archaeology from becoming a, a, a self-critical uh, social practice? The founders and animators of this positivist origin in Sri Lankan scholarship were the British civilians, civil, civilian, civil officers, who were fascinated by the ruined buildings that were hidden under layers and layers of thick jungle. These guys, especially, the, uh, especially in the dry zone of Sri Lanka. And I single out these three uh, figures because I, I consider them, they played a very pivotal role in making the idea of Amradapur and the idea of history as we think of it today. Sir James Emerson Tennant, Colonial Secretary, H.C.P. Bell of Sri Lanka Civil Service, and George Chanua played important roles in forming the modern ideas of Sri Lanka's past. European historical longings and the local chronicles of the island's history converged in these, in these three figures and many other colonial individuals also to form a so-called scientific history for the, for the island. I use this word scientific history is a word that many archaeologists and also historians would like to use the word scientific archaeology, scientific study of past. And at, at the distant beginning, these three individuals and several more others are there in informing this idea about the way we think about the past. Bell became the first commissioner of archaeology in 1890 of the newly formed Archaeological Survey of Ceylon. Tennant published a two-volume monograph of Sri Lanka titled Ceylon, an account of the island, physical, historical, and topographical, topographical <coughs> in 1859. He saw how many other books, how to catch elephants, you know, there's a book that he instructs how to catch elephants um, and tame them. And there are so many other books. Um, 
and turn on, turn over in 1837 did the first acceptable translation of Mahavamsa and paved way for Mahavamsa to be the authentic history of the island. Mahavamsa to be the, the real authentic history of, of, of the island. And the archaeology was, and, and, and the relationship, the relation between Mahavamsa and archaeology was and still is a two-way equation that continues to authenticate each other. Archaeology gets this privilege and authentication from Mahavamsa and Mahavamsa get authenticated by archaeological work. So, <clears throat> this is a belief. Now, this equation has established a seriously flawed notion that the past is synonymous with history. And this is my second concern in, in Sri Lanka's way of thinking about the past. This equation archaeology and Mahavamsa together has established a seriously flawed notion that the past is synonymous with history. This is a belief that has been hindering critical appraisal of historical and archaeological data in Sri Lankan scholarship. We know that our lives are spent with different forms and kinds of past, from historical past to archaeological past to anthropological past to geological past to all, there are so many pasts. And we are always and already caught in a web of past that makes our practical past. There's no one single past that we can rely on. And archaeological past is not equal to historical past. You know, you, I can give you some examples which I'm not going to, but say, see here. The historical past tells a different story from the chronicles, but the archaeological past we have found of see here, uh, a fifth century. Fortress is very different from what is given in, in the Mahamsa. <coughs> Restoration of stupas as a particular practice. Restoration of Buddhist stupas has been a contentious activity since the beginning of archaeology in Sri Lanka in the late 19th century under British rule. Archaeological work in the sacred city of Anuradhapura began in 1884. However, restoration, not conservation, was well <coughs> restoration was well outside the mission of the Department of Archaeology. So, what you see on the top is, the, is one of most revered and venerated stupas. That's how it was found. That's how how it entered the discourse of archaeology. Ruanwell stupa, and this is what Ruanwell stupa today is. Fully restored. And that is the Abegiri stupa, and this is how it is restored today. I want you to see the difference between these two restorations. Archaeological work in the work in the sacred city of Anuradhapura began in 1884. However, restoration was well outside the mission of the Department of Archaeology. Up until the 1940s, the Department of Archaeology maintained an anti-restoration stance. The colonial archaeologists saw the ruins too pass merely as ancient buildings with archaeological values. They saw restoration as not scientific. A stupa is the most prominent ritual building of Buddhist monasteries in Sri Lanka. Um, it is meant to enshrine relics of the Buddha. And as such, it, as such is considered a symbolic manifestation of Buddha himself. The stupas are colossal brick structures, as you can see. The Abhagiri Stupa in Anuradhapura, the, the main feature in this paper is 315 feet tall. So, that, that's the Abhagiri Stupa, that is 315 feet tall. Stupas contain high religious values and they are also politically strong symbols. Buddhists worship them and a range of, uh, of rituals is performed in venerating Stupas. Construction as well as restoration stupas is considered to invoke high religious merit to the pious patrons. That's how stupas are taken by, by the common, common people. Of course, not by archaeologists though. And, and I don't blame them for that. But that's an observation one can make. Why the stupas of Anuradhapura played an important role in the emergence of scientific archaeology? And in establishing a regime of historiographical truths in Sri Lanka in the late 19th century, the stupas and other archaeological ruins of Anuradhapura also gave rise to another regime of truths, 
a regime of modern single nationalism that transforms archaeological data into heritage data. This is something that we have to uh, pay special attention. As and when archaeology was becoming a so-called scientific discipline or scientific vocation <coughs> under the archaeological practice of colonial archaeologists, at the same time, that very entities became under the idea of heritage within the discourse of course of um, single nationalism or single Buddhist nationalism, so to speak. This transfer, transformation occurred through the use of the very historic, historiographical truth established by colonial scholars about non -Rathpura. Once again, this is another aspect, interesting aspect. But there is this study of the stupas and the ancient buildings and there is this scientific study of these things and a particular kind of history is built around them. Using the same argument, the same entities are made into heritage. So, archaeology and heritage is born at the same time in Sri Lanka, in Amradipura. So, this is something that one has to understand. Why is this, uh, why I see a crisis in, in a problem in, 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 the, in the way that we think of, of preserving uh, stupas, or, or, or the way that we practice archaeology or the Buddhist archaeology. <coughs> This, transform, this transformation from archaeology to heritage occurred through the use of the very historiographical truths established by colonial scholars about Ron Rathapura, setting into motion, setting into motion the claims for rightful preservation of Buddhist guardianship of Buddhist ruins of Ron Rathapura by Buddhists themselves. These ruins, excavated and consolidated by colonial archaeologists, archaeologists came under stewardship of Buddhist, uh, Sinhala Buddhist devotees who have formed restoration societies in the early 20th century. Um, this is it's a, it's a very interesting transformation, something that we do not try to spend enough time to understand what really happened in the early 20th century. <clears throat> to the cons considerable distress of colonial archaeologists, the early decades of the 20th century was a period of con confrontation with restoration societies which Ramani Vijasuriya at the next uh, lecture on this series will, will, will speak more about it. This was a period of confrontation with uh, restoration society that were campaigning for and actually doing the restoration of stupas in Anuradhapura. The wave of restoration of ancient stupas and religious, religious buildings of Sri Lanka, especially in Anuradhapura, was part of the, the religious revival movement, religious, religious revival movement that was related to the anti-colonial struggles, gathering momentum in that period. The Department of Archaeology, headed by colonial archaeologists and empowered with the Antiquities Ordinance of 1900, could not do much to halt the restoration wave led by popular nationalist figures wielding much popular political power with a strong anti-colonial rhetoric. Colonial archaeologists saw this, this as vandalism and named the people engaged in stupa restoration as pious vandals. I think that's a very creative name, pious yet vandals. <coughs> The pressure of the restoration wave seems to have been such that the Department of Archaeology sought to control the situation by revising the Antiquities Ordinance in 1940. Because the 1900 version did not allow the Department to intervene with restoration work carried out on ancient buildings such as stupas that are not in Crown land. If they were in the Crown land, they could intervene, but most of these things are not in, are not in Crown land. So the Department of Archaeology that ordinance did not had no provision for them to intervene. The 1940 revisions of the Antiquities Ordinance actually did not prohibit restoration of religious buildings, but prohibited unauthorized restoration and made restoration a, a, a prerogative of the department. This is this is a rather peculiar development, for this meant that the Department of Archaeology became the patron of restoration and maintenance of ancient buildings, ancient religious buildings which are by default living sacred sites of, of the country. I mean, this is where, this is a very, once again, the state became, like in the ancient days, state became the patron of, 
of temples by this distribution in the, in the ordinance. And the majority of them are, are Buddhist buildings. By the early 1960s, caught up in the nationalist politics that ensued with regaining political power from British rule in 1948, the department found itself engaged in restoring stupas at a wider scale across the country under pressure from the religious commu community. In a way, what happened with the revisions to the 1900 Antiquities Ordinance was the, depart was the department, by implication, the government became the caretaker of ancient Buddhist temples, a development that inadvertently caused a singular Buddhist nationalist streak in the practical application of the Antiquities Ordinance. Though it came to control something, but it had that possibility. So the department could act, uh, um, I mean, even today we find it you know, problematic. The department of archaeology could act like the department of Buddhist archaeology. You, know. you can always see that happening in Sri, uh, in Sri Lanka. Give me a minute, I, I have missed the particular slide. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is still there. <coughs> the restoration approach for ancient supas used by the department varied from total to partial restoration. It must be mentioned here that the total restoration of stupas was carried out when the department couldn't convince the incumbent monks to agree on partial restoration. The department did not do full, uh, complete restoration because they, total restoration because they wanted, because they could not convince the monks to agree on that. <coughs> this is an important aspect for, uh, for our discussion. Even today, the general sentiment in the Department of Archaeology and among the majority of Sri Lankan archaeologists is that restoration is something to be avoided because such intervention dis disrupt, disrupt and destroy the authenticity of the ancient stupas. Yeah, see, like, that is how Ruan Ruan Saya was found or entered the discourse of archaeology and that is how it is restored by uh, societies. Restoration society. So, most archaeologists don't agree with that. But that is one of the most revered uh, stupas in Anuradhi, for all in the country. When the Cultural Triangle Project, uh, even today, the yeah, archaeologists think, you know, doing rest restoration destroys the authenticity of, of the stupa. When the Cultural Triangle Project of the Central Cultural Fund was launched in 1980 with the endorsement of the UNESCO, the stupas in the CCF project were required to be conserved to preserve their authenticity as defined in the operational guidelines of the World Heritage Convention. This was a requirement since for religious sites within the Cultural Triangle were being prepared to be nominated for the inscription on the World Heritage List. So they became World Heritage Site soon after, uh, in around 1980s, because. But I want you to understand this. When we decided to present these things, these two parts to become World Heritage Sites, we had to follow a certain way of restoration, preserving a, a notion of authenticity in the fabric. So <clears throat> now, with that, a, a, a crisis brewed up, yeah. emerged. The sacred city of Anuragipur has three Buddhist monasteries. I think I have, well, I always do it, you know, stood up my line of slides. <laughs> <laughs> this is the guy who instigated that um, anti-restoration, uh, anti-colonial archaeology work in uh, Anuradhapura. He's called uh, uh, Singh Harishchandra in the early early 20th century. He is the one who transformed, who, he is the one who transformed archaeological data into heritage data. I'm sorry, I should have put this early on. Anyway, it's never too late, <laughs> I guess. Now let me go to the crisis. The sacred city of Anuradhapura has three Buddhist monasteries with three major school paths. The great Ranul Stupa, which we have already was restored in the 1930s by restoration societies. The Jetavana and the Abegri Stupa were to be conserved by the Cultural Triangle, and conservation plans were discussed with the relevant incumbent monks of the temple in the eight sacred temples of Anuradhapura. Anuradhapura has this, you know, 
eight sacred temples. So we have to discuss with these monks uh, if we do something in our life. So we discuss with them. Archaeological are experts of the Department of Archaeology and the Central Cultural Triangle. I am one of the experts of the Central Cultural Triangle. I must say I am not outside of this crisis. <laughs> so, convince the monks to agree to the principle of minimal intervention, but only to conserve the remaining historical fabric with minimum additions for structural strength. It was decided that the stupas would not have a final white plaster layer since, since that would cover the original fabric of the stupas. That means, so this is how, you know, that stupa, Mirsevati stupa was restored like this before the cultural triangle interview, you know. And here's another example. This is Department of Archaeology. This is the Atala Vera, which was, you know, it was fully restored. But in Anuradhapura, we made this agreement with the monks. Okay, we will restore this thing. Uh, this is Jethavan and Abhegari stupas, we will restore them, but after restoration, the Abhegari will not look like that. In the 80s, we came to an agreement with the monks. You are okay with me? You are with me, no? Yeah. It's a very interesting story. So, I will say experts of the department and, you know, I was also part of that as I, I was much junior those days, you know, I was listening. <laughs> We will conserve the, but it will never look like that. It will never have a, you know, white covering. These discussions and the resulting agreement were concluded in the mid-1980s by all parties. Thirty years later, however, when the Central Cultural Fund was ready to ceremonially launch the conserved Abhegiri Stupan, the monks demanded that the stupa should be restored to its ancient glory with the final coating of white plaster. Sri Lankan stupas are necessarily white in color and have no painted decorations. The ceremony to be attended by the then president was postponed. The archaeologists were angered and felt betrayed because the monks agreed 30 years ago that it, it, it's okay to be like that. But now that when we are about to ceremony law, you know, launch the rest of stupa, they, they they are not keeping the agreement. <laughs> but the archaeologists were angered and felt betrayed, and the National Archaeological Council, of which I am a member, lodged their contrary opinion with the president by signing a petition. I also had to sign it because I am an archaeologist, I am part of the Archaeological Council. You know, <laughs> it is now necessary for us to ponder why the monks did, departed from a 30 year old agreement. Another question at the same time is that arises is whether there was an agreement in the first place as such. And we say that, well, I know they agreed, or at least they didn't say anything against it. They kept silent, so we thought it's agreement. We went ahead with our plans and we got the World Heritage status. Now, 30 years after, they're not with us. As a general rule, no Buddhist monk wants a brick colored and encompassed stupa in a temple. We have a monk here. Everyone monk will speak for me, for, my, for what I say. Further, I suggest, if a monk agrees to a brick-colored and incomplete stupa, because this visual attributes confirm its archaeological value and its antiquity, then it is not because he wants it, but because he has no power and language to negotiate successfully with the expert from the department and the cultural triangle. I say this because monks who commonly wield power do not listen to experts nor do they respect the entities or monks. The powerful monks, no, they don't hear, they don't listen to, to us. In my view, during the 80s, the monks of this monastery pretended to be convinced by the experts. It was a very different political climate at that time. A climate not buttressed, buttressed by Buddhist populist nationalist slogans. This change was, this changed that, that climate very quickly by 83 with the Tamil guerrillas, guerrilla war, claiming a separate state for Tamil. In the war against the LTT, the Buddhist monks played a vital role and the sacred city of Anuradhapura being a historic place with a number of very sacred sites in the country played a pivotal role in, the, in, 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 in this campaign against the war. It was here 
that the popular Sinhala Buddhist nationalist sentiments were proclaimed to mobilize the Sinhala Buddhist South of the country against the LTT under the regime of former <laughs> President uh, Rajapaksa. After the government of Sri Lanka won the war in 2009, there was further consolidation of national sentiments in the Sinhala Buddhist South. This involvement empowered the incumbent monk of Avegri Vihare with the support of the other monks of the sacred city to voice their interpretation of what is authentic in a Buddhist stupa and departed from the 30-year agreement. This is how I make sense of it. it, did, it they did not just depart from the, that agreement. There was a reason now. They have, they are, their voice is more heard. This problem arose the, the problem that arose at Avegiriya may seem to portray the monks as monopolizing political power for their needs. But that really, I, I would argue, but that really is too simplistic and missing and, 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 and misses the point. The Buddhist monks have always wanted the stupas plaster and whitewash since the emergence of ancient ruined stupas as heritage expressions in the late 19th century. Monks usually express their interpretation of conservation or the restoration of an ancient stupa as their religious and traditional rites and condemn the approach of experts as Western and non-religious. For people like me, as, as Western and non-religious. Such contests arise when heritage is brought into programs of revitalization. That you cannot stop. That always happens. Traditional custodians of ancient religious sites under the purview of the Department of Archaeology become anxious and agitated when programs of revitalization visit properties under traditional ownership. This is because the archaeologists and heritage experts are famous for valuing and, and prioritizing the past over the living qualities of heritage. Archaeologists think this represents the fossilized past, but, but for the religious community, but for the Buddhist monks in living there, no, it, 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 it is a process. Of living, of the process of living culture. <clears throat> so we prioritize the past over the living qualities of heritage, thus depriving any degree of local developmental aspiration for heritage sites. We have endless fights with with these monks when they want a sangha vasa renewal. You know, or some 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 new infrastructure requirement comes in. We always we are very happy to condemn it. No, 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 you cannot do it. It's against the antiquity ordinance. Heritage experts rely on the concept of authenticity, while the traditional custodians of heritage places, uh, traditional custodians of heritage places and their associate communities rely on their lived experience to imagine a future for their heritage and themselves. We think of authenticity as of something in the past by but, but these traditional custodians. <clears throat> and the community, they rely on their lived experiences to imagine a future for their heritage and themselves. Both groups seem to think of heritage as facing, facing threats and agree that heritage needs to be protected. Defining heritage in relation to a perceived threat constitutes a major threat in modernist thinking, however. <laughs> the experts believe that the threat is to authenticity while the local custodians see a threat to continued uses of heritage to form a future from the past. They see that nobody is, uh, the government is not allowing them to develop into future. <clears throat> Let us now look at the case of the restoration of Sandagiri Stupa. So this is Abhagiri here. So this is Sandagiri Stupa, this is how we enter the discourse of what here. Just, you know, it's a mound. This stupa is part of a large monastic complex in Sasamara, dating back to 3rd century BC. It emerged, it entered the archaeological discourse in the early 20th century and it looked more like a mound with, with overgrown vegetation. In the, in the 1970s, the mound was cleared of vegetation and some conservation procedures were taken by the Department of Archaeology. The attention of, this, of the regional political leaders was drawn to the stupa in the mid 2000s and I'm not going to go into details of that attention, how that attention happened. However, and the restoration works of the stupa were completed by the Central Cultural Fund in 2016. But the restored stupa looks like no other stupa. It's more like a restored mound. This is what they did as restoration. How many of you accept this as a stupa? 
I'm part of this problem, okay? It's, it's, I'm part of the Special Cultural Fund. I've been to the launching ceremony of, of, of this after proudly presenting the, the, uh, this thing. But the problem is not that. The problem is, the real problem lies uh, somewhere else. I'll show you in a minute. <coughs> the archaeologists have, pre have presented a replica of the stupa in its <coughs> original form, constructed considering the archaeological finds from the site. Look at this. So that's the replica of the stupa that we did. And you now this is the chatra that we found. This is a real archaeological form. And that is the stump. And we see the plaster thing. So this, if the archaeologists believe that this is how it was, based on the archaeological finds, quote unquote scientific finds, why didn't they do that on this? That's my, that's my concern. That's why I'm trying, I don't have an answer to this. So this is what we have to consider. As you can see in these images, the archaeologists have found a number of important points to suggest its original form, and they have done a replica accordingly. My question is, why couldn't they do that in their restoration work? What prevented them, or what detained them from doing what the archaeological finds suggest in the restoration of the stupa? So what is this problem that is detaining us from doing what we really claim to believe? in a way, the problem of authenticity. In order to proceed further, it seems necessary to engage with the idea of authenticity that plays a decisive role in the heritage profession, in the heritage profession and its implication in a context like Sri Lanka, a context inscribed with post-colonial anxieties, nationalist sentiments and democratic political rivalries. You know, it's not just archaeology what is happening here. Given, all, given the complex history of archaeology and heritage in Sri Lanka, and the complexities of contemporary Sri Lankan political culture, it is clear that the idea of authenticity as defined within the authorized heritage discourse cannot be applied without redefining its scope. The authorized heritage discourse, the AHD. AHD sees authenticity of heritage within the perspective that heritage is study. Heritage is a frozen past. This has given rise to a fabric-based perception of authenticity that sees heritage as an objectified past. This formulation of authenticity in heritage has very limited space for the performance of intangible heritage. And in living sacred sites, this is very problematic. It's almost impossible to maintain. The concept of authenticity became a problem when it was presented as a necessary criterion to be observed in the operational guidelines for the implementation of World Heritage Convention in the 70s. The guidelines required the World Heritage to meet the test of authenticity, and authenticity was considered in the four areas of design, material, workmanship, and setting of the sites considered for inscription in the World Heritage List. Heritage sites that are also living sacred sites could not easily fit with the, with the established notions of the concept of authenticity as couched in the operation, operational guidelines without giving rise to a crisis in heritage thinking in context where past and traditions are past and traditions are being performed and reenacted in living sacred sites at an everyday basis. The crisis contains within itself far-reaching political implications that are directly connected with regional and national political campaigns and struggles. Um, <clears throat> a singular definition of authenticity for all situations is not tenable in an increasingly globalized world. The very idea of world heritage as a universal concept and uniform set of standards is not politically realistic in the contemporary world, especially in our part of the world. I don't think it's, I know it's not practical in South America or in India or in Sri Lanka or in Burma, no. The World Heritage Convention is not the only universalizing modernist document in force. Other conventions such as the Convention for Intangible Heritage and the Convention for the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions are also in force that allow the traditional custodian to speak a different language of power and to do away with heritage, heritage experts. That is happening, you know. These traditional custodians are not isolated islands. They already know that language, but at least they exploit that language. I'll give you one good example on that. Ideas, uh, and terminology of these documents have already entered the argumentative parlance of some of the traditional custodians. Of course, 
with an added quota of self-interest. A good example is the World Heritage Site of Dambula Golden Rock Temple in Sri Lanka, where I have been working for, for more than 30 years. So this is Dambula Golden Rock Temple. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful sites in the world. I mean, there's a bit of nationalism there. <laughs> <laughs> At least I mean, you know, I spent my youth in this in this caves. I know these these young people are coming to see that. And this is what happened. Um, violating the Antiquist Ordinance, is what this powerful monk there, he put this uh, golden Buddha and golden stupa and you know this concrete, uh, uh, this, you know, some people, the learned people of Colombo call it the Las Vegas Buddha. <laughs> Yet, yeah. let's, let's, let's take it serious though. Why is it happening? What prompts it? What, what, what does it make? What does him what empowers him to do this? My argument is us, we empower him indirectly with, by forgetting certain realities of these temples. The powerful incumbent of the temple has reimagined part of the ancient temple on these terms by building a colossal golden painted Buddha statue and other structures and a long line of painted concrete statues of monks holding building walls. For some, this is vulgarization. I know, for most of you, this is vulgarization. But for the hundreds of people who worship there and for the traditional custodians of the temple, it is not vulgarization, but continuing a tradition and asserting their traditional rights to the temple. I'm not, prom I'm not promoting this. I'm trying to make sense, I'm trying to understand this. Why this happened? So, we were given free education, we were given scholarship to go all over the world to understand heritage politics and theory and all that. But yet, this is, it's like we do successful operation, but the patient dies. But this is what happened at Dumbledore in front of our own eyes. I think this is where, this is our problem. This is not the monk, uh, uh, this monk's problem. This is the archaeologist's problem. Our inability to think of a condition, of a situation, of a problem at, uh, that is right there. The kitsch, the expert, see, uh, the kitsch, the, the kitsch, the expert seeing the new addition doesn't really matter to the devotees. And the monks, I did a field survey. I did a survey. I went to, from house to house asking with a questionnaire. What a stupid thing to do. <laughs> I was so, what, no, no. People were very proud of this in Dabulla. I did a 10, 10 mile circle thing to make sense of it. Uh, yeah. The, the past for the contemporary rural individuals does not live so much in materials, but in rituals, in ways and manners of thinking about things. That is where, that is where for them uh, these things live. As I review the current con contest between local religious communities and heritage experts, I would consider Dabulla an extreme case in indigenism. Uh, you know, it's an indigenous approach to preserving heritage. An extreme case gone by. While the Abhigiri and Sandhagiri Sire are extreme cases in internationalism gone by. This is how I, this is how I see it. I, even if I stand on my head, I cannot come out with a so-called scientific reason why we should not plaster that in white. Because it's an archaeological fact. It's an empirical fact. Why? Not plastering it for technical reason, for lack of funds is different. In principle, we have, and restoring Sandhagiri Stupa like a cockpit tour, like, like a cupcake. I cannot find any archaeological reason for that because archaeologists have shown up there are enough reason to think it's original form. <clears throat> I must make it very clear that my argument is not that we should be restoring Buddhist stupas to their perceived ancient glory as such. But my concern is about the reluctance or the inability of the community of Sri Lankan archaeologists to take archaeology as a critical practice and engage with the archaeological issues that have embedded social, cultural and political imperatives. In my view, this is, there is a seriously problematic condition in Sri Lankan archaeology. Archaeology cannot be reduced to a series of methods in the field or in the laboratory. But having said all that, there, then there is still a, a much deeper, much serious uh, condition, a problem lurking, uh, hiding behind that. Don't think it's about science. In the end, this, 
both these extremes are about ethno nationalism. I'll tell you how. Yeah. This is my final thesis about this, what I found from my research. This after the <coughs> What is ironic here is that both these extremes approaches are subservient to ethno-nationalist schemes. Not just nationalist, ethno-nationalist. I cannot go into detail. If you take the case of Kurundi Viharaya three months or six months ago, we think of archaeology as this mega scientific discipline. And we take that and go to margins of the island, like say where the Tamil minority is is the majority and go to the jungle and find this ruined site and try to make it a living uh, using archaeology and uh, uh, and use the power of archaeology or scientific archaeology preserve it and try to convert it to a living sacred site, treat it like a living sacred site and then come out with rules and regulations to evacuate you know displacing people and you know throwing people away this is what it is doing in the end this is why we are not letting it to be a critical practice. We, we try to think that archaeological truths are about other truths of a place. Archaeology is one department among so many others in a university. Uh, in my university, all university, we have department of archaeology, department of sociology, department of cultural studies, department of English literature, department of anthropology. A place, a temporality of place is defined by, not only by archaeological truths, also by anthropological, social science, cultural studies. So this is why heritage is a management issue. You don't go to a place, especially uh, in, in, in the northern or eastern parts of, of Sri Lanka where there is a problem of uh, an ethnic problem and go with archaeology and forget all other aspects of a place and try to claim it from, uh, from a Try to claim it under your, your nationalist thinking. So this is why these two, both these extremes, they don't listen to people. They all listen to a, a preferred group of people. They don't listen to people in general. That's my, my, my thesis. Thank you very much.